Thank you for coming for our second uh, talk, TR Talks. TR Talks are intended to be a conversation where uh, people in, in our community who are interested in innovation, who are interested in mobilizing knowledge, come together and talk with experts and key opinion leaders um, we are very privileged to, tonight to not only have the people that were originally on the bill, but also a guest surprise participant um, who uh, I will introduce very quickly, Steve, uh, simply because he ropes me into stuff and he's now been roped to be on stage. Um, he will add some color, as I, he always does. Um, to the conversation. So I just wanted to acknowledge that these talks are supported by the Global Cannot Fund, um, and uh, they are part of the Translational Research Program, which is a degree program. If you know people that wanna think different, wanna innovate differently, uh, wanna innovate, wanna challenge the status quo, tell them to look into applying for next year. Um, and it's also brought to you by the Translational Research Hub, which is a collaboration that we've put together between the Department of Medicine, Psychiatry, Surgery, uh, Imaging, and Pediatrics. And so all of these people are bringing you together just conversations on innovation, and I know you didn't come to see me, so I'm gonna hand over to our amazing uh, moderator, Sal. Great. So thank you, Joseph. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Sal Spadafora. I'm Vice Dean of Post-MD Education in the Faculty of Medicine. Up until fairly recently, I was also an anesthesiologist at Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, I'd like to declare, I don't think I have any conflicts. Uh, I, I have many conflicts, but not uh, with uh, being here this evening to talk uh, uh, with you about uh, funding translation. Uh, when I told my family I was coming to discuss funding translation. They wondered what that had to do with medicine and thought this was a linguistics uh, talk. Um, so what we're gonna do this evening is we're gonna get the three um, guests to uh, introduce themselves, and then we're gonna give them about seven minutes or so to, to give us their views on funding translation and what they see are some of the major barriers and challenges uh, in, and, and systemic issues, not only in the local ecosystem, but nationally and internationally, and uh, perhaps some comparators as where other people may be getting things right. Uh, so we'll start with uh, introductions and seven minutes or so a piece, and then we really wanna launch in to hear what you have to say. And um, I believe Yasmin will be going around with a mic. So if you have uh, questions, you can put your hands up and uh, the mic will be key so that we can all hear the question and we don't have to repeat things. So without further ado, we're gonna get some uh, intros so I can skip the page and a half bios. Yeah, so uh, my name's Steve Mann. I was just actually coming over as an attendee, but uh, Joseph wrote me into being <laughs> a participant. <laughs> so uh, so anyway, I'm, I, I, I live close to here, so it was a short walk. I'm about two minutes on foot. I live right across from the AGO, the art gallery, and that's my wife and two kids. And uh, I've got a lab there, also kind of live in lab where we founded Interaxon. We founded a company that makes a product called the Muse, this brain sensing headband, and the Muse 2 is a newer product. And uh, I guess I've been doing wearable computing since my childhood when I connected a bunch of equipment to my body to monitor my heart and I could see my heart waveform in my screen as I'm running around and you know all kinds of wearables things and I built a smartwatch back in 1998 uh, cover Linux Journal 2000 and before that back in the 70s I built all kinds of health monitor sensing and so my idea was to use wearable technologies for health monitoring and to uh, and wellness and well-being I'm uh, David Naylor. I'm here under fraudulent auspices. Uh, to my right is the first uh, human cyborg, a pioneer of wearables and many other things. To my left is someone who also has a startup, as does Steve, with his involvement with Interaxon. I'm a defunct academic bureaucrat, but I will speak for a few minutes and hopefully not bore you to tears. Um, my name is Milos Popovic. I'm a professor in the Institute of Biometrics and Biomedical Engineering. And I'm also director at uh, Kite, 
Kite is the research arm of Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. And I'm an engineer by training, and I've designed a couple of things in my life, and one of them seems to work these days. So it's called Mind Move, and we can, I may talk about it a little bit. Great. So thanks for those introductions. Uh, maybe I will leave it to the three of you to decide who wants to go first and maybe give us your reflections uh, around what you feel some of the barriers are to funding systemic translational research and how we can develop some mechanism and support systematic uh, value-driven translation in our uh, current setting and uh, maybe talk a little bit about beyond our current setting. Okay, I can start. Uh, I'm not really an expert in the field. I've been doing what I've been doing like um, a blind individual trying to find entrance and exit in, a, in, a, in the room. So I had some uh, interesting experience during this whole process. But one thing which really uh, kind of resonates with me is one of the one of the comments that Ayakoka, who used to be the CEO of Chrysler when he revived Chrysler and make it very successful, he made a very interesting comment. He said, you know, when you're writing grants, it looks like, and that applies for knowledge translation and, 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 and commercialization, is you, you're writing a grant and then you're giving to your peers to evaluate it. And then they will say whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. And he compared this if Chrysler were come up with the newest design of the car, and then they go to Ford and GM, for GM and Ford to approve that to be funded. That structure has many advantages. One advantage is when you do research, you actually have peers who look at it and say this is viable or not viable. However, if you do something which is out of ordinary, or you're trying to do something that is fundamentally different from what has been done in the field, there's a high probability that this is going to be torpedoed. And I have one year had a very interesting experience. I wanted to try CAHR and I get three of my colleagues, two of my colleagues and we together write three grants. One grant was revolutionary in a way how we wanted to do something. The other grant was kind of okay. And the fourth grant was a cookie cutter, you know, typical things that you would do just incremental scientific outcomes. As you can guess, the, the, the third one, the last one has been funded, the other ones have not. And that has been my experience. And the better I have been with the technology and the closer my product has, my idea has been to a product, my scores on CHR start diminishing. So when I was really ready to launch the company, my score was 2.8. And David will tell you that's pathetic because you need to have four and above in order to be actually get anywhere. So the environment is not set for uh, uh, unique, universe, unique ideas which can totally transform the field. And we have, have a lot of granting agencies, we have all kind of different people who look at your intellectual property and advise you. And trust me, I've seen every single one in Toronto and I have failed with every single one of them. And now that I got all kind of awards from University of Toronto and UHN, the inventor of the year, and who knows what, it doesn't really matter. Then they don't like to discuss the fact that in early stages, they all suggested that what I'm doing is totally idiotic and wrong and not eventful and, and, and not relevant. So this is the environment we are in. And I think uh, what needs to change is the way how we train the people. The, the, the way how we value the innovation and how we actually become um, more friendly to idea that we will fail with investing in different projects. So yes, this is an out there project. It's highly you know, unpredictable, it's risky. We should invest in that because the return on investment, if that's successful, will be huge. And we will fail many, many times. However, one or two will be successful and that will move the field the, the medical field is specifically forward dramatically. And, and we, I'm personally interested in that, rather those incremental type of things. So that's my two cents. So, so we are in an environment uh, that is fairly risk averse. Uh, it doesn't tolerate failure that well, and in fact, uh, highly discourages it. Uh, failure is a high risk activity in, the, in our ecosystem. And so how do we uh, structure things in a way 
that uh, encourages people to fail. Yep. Uh, and, uh, and, and what do we learn from that failure is yep. what you're sort of driving exactly. at. So maybe, David, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, let, let me focus, uh, if I can, on two things. One is sort of the conceptual framework of translation, idiosyncratic view. The other is funding, because that's very much at the core of what we're talking about today. If, if you think about translation, it's somewhat useful to think of it in buckets. So we think of the basic scientists who translate their work to the clinical sphere or the industrial sphere. We can think of clinical scientists who are translating their ideas into practice. We can think of institutions and organizations that are pioneering innovations, trying to scale them. You can think of population health innovations, where you're looking at a much larger sweep through regulation or community health intervention. So there's translation in these different domains with different interventions that are under scrutiny and being evaluated. That's the first point. And the, one of the things to, to keep really squarely in mind is the rules for evaluation, the regulatory framework, and the capital to tolerate risk and scale and refine an innovation and get it into use, uh, they, they vary hugely by domains. Right now we've got a big uh, press on artificial intelligence. Um, I'm co-chairing a CIFAR task force, national task force on AI and health. And if you think about that as a domain, you know, the FDA is now regulating algorithms and trying to figure out, you know, what one does with algorithms. Yet, if you think of deep learning and most of the forms of artificial intelligence and data science, those algorithms can be biased by who's sampled. On the other hand, they're continuously improving because they learn from the data as they absorb it. So it's a very different way of thinking about things as opposed to a drug where you, you've got all the FDA evidence and you say yes or no. This, this is a kind of moving target. So every realm has some distinct features. That's the first message. Second message is on funding. Um, you know, the only startup I've really been involved in was, gosh, 27 years ago, something called the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences that is still going, I'm happy to say. But what I did uh, have was an interesting experience with another sort of startup, and that was when the Medical Research Council was transitioning into the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. And a bunch of us were involved in not only planning the transition, but chaired early committees to look at areas that the MRC didn't do. So it's a pretty hostile environment doing a committee for health services research in what was still the sort of transitional MRC environment. But what was really striking to me was that we kept getting things that would be right in your wheelhouse and we had no idea what to do with them. So as a committee, we would get very applied interventions that were valuable to an organization, potentially to the healthcare system, but they needed co-funding by a province or a hospital or a clinical group, and all that was unspecified. And certainly wasn't going to be the MRC was, that was going to pay for it. So we ended up basically sweeping aside all those applications from that committee and looking for generalizable, tidy things that fit a particular mold. Um, the scientific officer of that committee, I was chair and I advocated with the Prime Minister's office and others to create what became the Canadian Foundation for Health Services, now the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. So there would be a place where that translational research in the health system could go. So this has been a long-standing problem that we don't have receptor capacity that funds translational research. Anything that's in the interstices, whether it's transdisciplinary or between, you know, big buckets like clinical and basic, all those things have a risk of being orphans in terms of the funding system. The last thing to say is that uh, I was involved in the last few years after demitting the Kremlin, as I used to call Simcoe Hall, um, with two federal panels. One was on healthcare innovation, happy to talk about that later and what we found in terms of what really was a kind of unfriendly environment for funding and scaling innovation right across Canada in healthcare. So we talk about that later, some of the findings, but th this, is, this is a big challenge for our system. Uh, the receptor capacity is limited. The second was more recently a report on funding fundamental research, 
very different orientation from translation, but still in the same bucket. Right? We, we said we were interested in science very broadly. We were not drawing lines that said it had to be pristine and tidy and on a bench top. We were interested in the whole shooting match. And I would just say, we had a little bit of a period under Mr. Harper as Prime Minister where the focus was so much on partnerships and particularly industry partnerships. I'm not sure we actually supported people who wanted to build innovations with nonprofit partners or who had ideas that could become destructive industries. You know, Jeff Hinton, funded for all those years by an insert grant, changed the world. So I think we have a challenge still in our system uh, not only is the grant funding of the budget 2018 was positive, not only are we short in terms of funding open science, independent research, we are still struggling as a country with how to fund the type of research or evaluation, if you like, that I believe all of you are interested in doing. So tough environment, um, happy to chat more about that in the question and answer, but uh, encourage greatly Joseph to see the interest and to know that this is a field that's alive and well and growing. In that I asked David in part to come here and see you, to see that some of the work that he has done in the past, um, and some of the people that you've met that have been his protégés that have done, that have resulted in a room full of people interested in translating science for impact. So that's one of the reasons he agreed to come, is to see what you have to say and what you're and I thought he'd come to see me, but I'm wrong. Um, so really a, a tough environment, you say, uh, David, and uh, I think twas ever thus. And I often ask around the table when I notice we're all getting into a bit, a bit of a group think on things, I say, who amongst us would have ever given Frederick Banting a lab, some dogs, a medical student, a grad student, and some funding? The guy was a guy with a big idea, a failed general practitioner from the corner of Queens and Adelaide in London, Ontario. His area of training and, and, and interest was orthopedics, and some chair took a chance. And uh, I'm not sure we'd do that today, and maybe we should start. What, what's interesting is the histories, the early histories, all wrote the chair out of them. It was Banding and Best. And you know the, the fact that someone took that step and then was vilified by the sort of glorification of the, the dyad is interesting. That's been changed, obviously, but it's, it's, a, it's a telling example that not only do we not reward failure, we don't re necessarily reward those who encourage risk takers in our, our funny system. Or equal opportunity that way, right? We're hard on you both ways. Yes, thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here among this, this this fun world, and I really, I was moved quite a bit, Miles, my, my about your Ford GM, you know, Ford Motor Company getting its cars evaluated by General Motors, for example. It's kind of an interesting, interesting idea. If you if you plotted a graph of the quality uh, on the x-axis, if you put the uh, sort of the talent level, and on the y-axis, you put the outcome, it kind of would go up and back down again. You know, maybe concave down. There's a certain level of mediocrity that hits the maximum value on there, and I guess that would get through the Ford GM filter. Um, I, I kind of think uh, uh, translation, uh, one, one way, uh, I, I guess at, at first glance, I almost think of translation is to health as engineering is to science. You know, engineering used to be called practical science, you know, if you look at, at the old uh, terminology for it. And so, you know, getting this applied uh, practical universe. And, and so, uh, I, I kind of grew up building things in my childhood, making things, and I had fun making things. And I had this crazy idea that I wanted to have this device that would see inside my body and monitor all my body's function. So I made these, I used to make little heart uh, monitors and put electrodes on my chest and connect them up to a little cathode ray oscillograph and mounted my eyeglasses so while I was jogging, I could watch my own heart waveform ECG. I did all these crazy things, you know, as I was growing up. and. Um, uh, people thought I, I was nuts or something, and uh, then I, I got accepted at MIT, and I went down there, and I found the world of all these people who are sort of engineers, and, and in many ways, we were sort of the outcasts of society, and Harvard used to call us the greasy plumbers, the people who were social misfits, and it was kind of like 
uh, you know, we're into technology rather, you know, and, and making things and making things work. Engineering is about getting things to work. And so I was always interested, and yet the health universes, there's so much bureaucracy. When we were founding some of these different companies, we'd often, uh, instead of going for health grants and big complicated government grants, we'd, we'd often want to think at the speed of business and, and quickly just come up with something. So we, we came up with a lot of fun things. We had, at my place on Dundas Street across from the AGO, we had a bunch of concerts there and we had brainwave concerts and we invite people over to play musical instruments across the web with their brains. And we had Parkinson's patients in New York coupled into this brainwave collective and we had made this cyborg collective so that people all over the world uh, including some people confined to wheelchairs and so on, could participate in this brainwave concert, making music with their mind. And the, the project got captured a lot of interest, and we were invited by the, the Ontario government to be the main uh, showpiece for the 2010 Vancouver Olympics with this piece that we had controlling lights in the CN Tower and the Parliament buildings in Niagara Falls. And so we, we had this little thing that started in my house as a fun little thing where we'd invite people from the neighborhood and turn into something that, that sort of grew and and we we got uh, a product launched and another product after that. And so now we have the world's largest database of labeled EEG brainwave data. And we sort of bypassed the usual bureaucracy of, of medicine and, and, and went quick. And I noticed when things want to happen, they, they, they sometimes happen quick. I was invited over to China because they saw my, my work. I mean, I started in the Toronto area. I was born in Hamilton near here and lived, grew up in this area. And then went down to MIT. And while I was there, a lot of my inventions were wanted in Silicon Valley. So I got pulled back and forth across to Stanford and Silicon Valley to make things happen there. And a lot of things, a lot of my, my work, one of the inventions was HDR, high dynamic range imaging, now used in more than 2 billion smartphones. So a lot of these things I was doing were suddenly of interest rather than on the lunatic fringe. And, and then uh, some people in China contacted me, the mayor of Chengdu, and then a bunch of other mayors started right, contacting me and saying, hey, we want you to bring this over there. And I went over to China, and within uh, a couple of days of my landing in China, they had given me $2.5 million just to try some ideas to build a lab there and then work on a larger grant. And I, we ended up meeting with with uh, our prime minister, our premier, and the mayor of Toronto. The premier at the time was Kathleen Wynne. So we're sitting here meeting with the, 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 the prime minister, the premier, and the mayor uh, in China, though. Like, I'm meeting these other Canadians in China. You know, the Chinese had sort of facilitated this. There's a quickness. There's a real movement in Shenzhen. So we have two buildings in Shenzhen now, and we've got a lab there. We make things. This product was actually made in Xiamen. And Xiamen is sort of the rising place. Shenzhen is kind of the world center of making things, but Xiamen has arisen in, the new, in this new way. So I noticed things happen really quickly outside the health bureaucracy. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering if funding and all that sort of thing, I'd love to write grants, you know, if any of you guys want to write a grant proposal and work together and write something on wearables and healthcare or anything like that, I'm, I'm all in. But... Uh, the process feels like it's slow. I, I haven't felt loved by the granting agencies as much as just doing things. And, and uh, so I don't know, to translate these ideas into practice, it almost feels like we need to either, uh, we need an alternative model. If Ford is going to have to get all the cars approved by GM, then I think we're in for a very slow haul compared to, we're gonna, the Chinese are gonna eat us for breakfast. Like they're just moving at lightning they're, they're speed. They're on lunch already. They're, they're <laughs> on to lunch. Um, so uh, thank you for those comments. And I, I think what we want to do now is really uh, open things up. Um, uh, by the way, it's, I think it's the first time I've heard the word granting agency and love in the same sentence. So thank you for that. Um, Yasmin has the mic, and uh, we really want to hear from you. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of uh, questions, and I think, Yasmin, you go ahead. Introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and uh, ask your question. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming in, guys. My name is Ben O'Young. I'm a seventh-year MD, PhD student. I'm currently with Warren Chan uh, in IBBME. Um, so my question is, uh, as a student, uh, as a graduate student, 
if I do make a discovery and I make an invention that I think is uh, potentially translatable, uh, knowing that the, the funding agencies are not the best bet for getting money, where do we go in Toronto to get money uh, to help push our ideas forward? Yeah, I, I think one thing, if you want to really make something happen, I think is is sort of the entrepreneurship, what we call entrepreneurship, invention plus entrepreneurship. You take your invention and bring it out to market. And I think that that's one way to really move uh, at, at a, a lightning speed and then develop the technology. And so that's kind of what we did. And then now we've got all kinds of medical doctors working with us and we're at Stanford with the Stanford Medicine. We're working with Stanford Neuroscience and we've got huge trials going on at Stanford and MIT and everything. So I think the thing to do is to, is to quickly uh, jump to funding within Toronto is growing. Toronto's really a growing epicenter of many things. It, it has stayed the world's epicenter of wearable technologies and it still remains the world's epicenter of brain sensing technologies and wearables. So if you're in the world of, I, I don't know, can you tell me what it is that you're trying to get off the ground and I can give you specific advice? Yeah, maybe it's more of like a, almost like a pharmaceutical. So um, not quite sure how I can get that out to market without doing some sort of, uh, without recruiting a large sum of money at the very beginning. Yeah, to prove that's, that it works. Um, that's tough because you, 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 Toronto is a tough, market for that sort yeah, of thing. So, so things there on that specific front, Steve, I'd say things are again better than they were. A um, lot, lot more venture capital uh, in the, the sphere for biologics uh, than there, there would be or pharmaceutics. The, the challenge in part is that we don't have the sort of CRO capacity to do things like the relevant chemistry, the manufacturability, etc. Th that is accessible through partners actually that work closely with institutions in Toronto. So it's through San Diego group, Triface, it's very competent, it's closely tied to Toronto. So you can get that done um, pretty effectively. But the, the challenge is that those, back to what I said, the regulatory pathway is completely different as you know. You've got all the different requirements for HVB, FDA. So those are very expensive long-term things to bring forward. Uh, software is faster. Devices are in between. Algorithms look like they're going to be in between like devices and the biologics in that realm, the pharmaceutics are a real slog. So um, you do need a series of, in, of investors who'll go the rounds with you, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. So that, that's it's going to take expert advice and finding people who know the venture capital scene locally and you'll probably need international venture capital at some point. But it, it's so worth doing because we're in this really interesting phase of acceleration where things are moving faster, as Steve said. Um, you know, this, the system itself is sludgy, but in some of these areas of innovation, things have picked up pace. So I think it's go for it. Just one comment. You need somebody who can help you write a business plan, somebody who will understand what is the value of what you're proposing and how you can make money out of it, because if you cannot make kind of money out of it, and it's, the pathway is not obvious, it's not going to work. What is fundamental, if you come up with something new, usually you need a new way of making money with this technology, right? So the innovation is not just the device or the medication, but it's also a new business model how to do that. New solution, a new business model. How, usually we have one type, you're going to be an MD, PhD, you will have physiology and knowledge of patients pretty solidly firmed in your knowledge base. But how do you attract the money? How do you get angels? How do you get it? Is definitely not what we have trained you during your MD, PhD. So you need to connect with somebody, uh, as uh, David suggested, who has that expertise and only in, in a partnership you can do it. If you try to do it on your own, that's almost mission impossible. Or it takes you so long time to learn all that, that you will miss all the deadlines and somebody else will come and take it away from you. <laughs> no apologies uh, <laughs> being a bit self-serving, but uh, Paul Pompier and I are the co-directors of the Health Innovation Hub. If you have an idea, come to our website. Exactly. Um, we don't take equity. We don't do anything but give you mentorship and, 
and our opinions. Uh, maybe not good advice, but definitely opinions. And we will connect you with, with people in our networks, including some of our mentors that are on stage, um, to help you get started. So, so H2I for sure uh, is a great spot to go. And I think what I'm, what I'm hearing is that what we really need is a bit of a community of practice. Uh, you know, we need to be connected. Uh, you need to have someone you can tap on the shoulder and get some mentorship from, some guidance. Uh, I think we're, this is in its infancy. I, I hope that when we come back in a decade or two decades, that question is not really a question. It's sort of a given that, of course, you just know where to go and people can guide. If it's two decades, we're in big trouble. So, okay, uh, how about uh, two years, two years. I'd say this is, when I look back just since I'm 103 years old, if I look back to uh, even five years ago, the ecosystem was, was really very different. So th this is an accelerating process. I think there's lots of reason for optimism about what you can do here. The, the biologics and the drugs are the toughest, but it's still, it's a playing field that has movement and possibilities galore that weren't there before. So get some mentorship and just Get moving. Yeah, front row, eh? uh, hi, I'm Aaron Yorkwich. I'm graduating my PhD in December over at Kite and University of Toronto. Um, so my question, I guess, let's take this more from the um, devices and the AI side of it, as opposed to the pharmaceutical side. Um, I see that, um, as you mentioned, with um, the Health Innovation Hub, they don't claim any IP from these companies as they're getting started. And I was wondering why U of T, why UHN doesn't do this sort of, same sort of model where they don't claim the ownership, they allow the inventor to have 100% of the ownership, something like Waterloo or Velocity would have. So I'll answer that. Um, first, there's absolutely no evidence that an inventor owns is superior to some institutional co-ownership. Places like Israel, Taiwan, other places do not do that. This is local mythology or national mythology. There's absolutely no evidence from a systematic review of the literature that any IP regimen is what conditions success. What conditions success is the ecosystem. So when people tell me that, you know, Waterloo has lots of startups, first, Toronto startup community is massively greater despite those regimens. And secondly, I think a lot of that was just a great history of innovation and some very neat focus on software and computer science, things that were scalable quickly that drove that. And then you get the ecosystem and boy, it'll churn just like ours is churning now. So I don't buy the argument. Um, the other challenge with the argument you're making is, and this is something that we've debated locally, the hospitals and the university have very different IP regimens. The hospitals are institutional ownership. So you're gonna to say to me, well, that's really suffocating. Well. The Bayh-Dole Act in the U.S. is institutional ownership. And you're going to tell me that Stanford, Berkeley, Harvard, MIT are inferior to Toronto, Waterloo, and their institutional ownership. That's what the hospitals have. So it's the ecosystem, again, that matters. I'm sympathetic, actually, to very limited institutional ownership. So U of T goes with a sliver. We reduced it on my watch as president to try to maximize incentives for inventors. And I would say to you, if you don't have some sliver for the institution, and you do get into one of the things I've heard from the Waterloo system, because there are lots of friends there, is you get battles about IP because stuff doesn't get ironed out and cleaned up properly. So it's not bad to have an institution that looks after some of that. So um, I'm not going there in terms of the IP argument, sorry. And the other element is once you translate IP, even if the percentages are very high, that's first stage you will have to have six or seven or eight stages before this becomes really a viable product. By that time, the percentage that you give to institution is single digit, if it's even single digit. So that worry and concerns that you have are really not, 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 not even relevant. It may be in the first step because that's what you see as, as your first interaction, right? But it's a journey which typically takes number of years and you get diluted, or depending what kind of involvement you have, if you're constantly involved, then you will keep your shares in at the higher level. But uh, if you're not involved, you, and, and universities are not involved because they allow companies to move forward and, and, and uh, 
then the percentages come down to really low, very low numbers, and it's quite reasonable for any investor to come in because it's not burdening anybody. It's not bad to have a 700-pound gorilla like U of T fighting to protect your share of the money when you're doing battle with some hungry venture capitalist who'd like to squeeze you to nothing. Is, is your issue with the, um, the, the percentage or, or more just the, the, the having an encumbrance? Like even if it was a really small percentage, super small epsilon, but it required the paperwork and everything, is that, is that the problem you're having maybe? I don't know if it's really a problem like for me per se right now. I think early on I did have an issue when it was full ownership by the um, institution, um, but um, with the U of T model, I think it's a little bit different. So See, I don't know. See, MIT much. took a, a, a small, like with MIT, you, you can own quite a bit. You can do a business and you can go out and run business. MIT takes a little bit. I guess where, where it hurts most, I would say, is not so much in the percentage because the percentage that MIT takes is quite small, like in, in our lab anyway, the way it worked out. But it was more the um, encumbrance, I guess, the the inertia to movement that it would induce to have to kind of get things signed and work stuff through, you know, versus being able to act super quick. And, and so I guess um, maybe you want to think in your mind to separate out those two factors, one being percentage of ownership uh, and the second being, you know, quickness to be able to move and how, how swift, like, uh, you know, Colin Swift introduced that fast. Uh, uh, well, 700 pound gorilla, gorillas move very slowly, but they're very fierce when, it, when you need someone in your corner to fight for you. So it's a two edged both. sword. I, I didn't call it the Kremlin for nothing. Hi, Great. Um, someone from the back of the room. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Sudesh. Uh, so I'm a student at TRP. And uh, my question is you know, there are so many challenges associated with commercialization of technology. And uh, it's, you know, one major challenge is funding, but then there are so many challenges like R&D and, you know, sourcing all these materials. And, and from an investor's point of view, uh, you know, it takes a much longer uh, time for them to uh, sort of get their money back. Uh, you know, they've made an investment, but it takes much longer. So it, the duration is long. So, you know, what, how, how can entrepreneurs sort of navigate through this, like if, if they're working in this space? Okay, so... There's all kind of recipes in the process, right? Um, you need to get a funding, and you need to get a funding from somebody who actually understands what you're doing. If you're in a business of designing pacemakers and you get a funding from somebody who's building buildings, that's not really a good match, and you will pay for it. Second thing is you need to have very clearly defined what are the milestones that you want to achieve in order to increase the value of what you're doing? Because you can do five million things, right? There's all kinds of things that you can do with the product or with, with, with the drug. But there's milestones that are very clearly defined by VCs or investors that they want to see. And when you reach that milestone, that, then the money comes in. So you have to be disciplined, very focused. You have to choose your target really well because as every scientist, this is my great idea and can solve all the problems in the universe. Choose one, which has the highest weight, and you follow that very strictly. And you have to be very disciplined to control how much money you burn to get the first milestone. Once you meet the first milestone, that shows them that you have a discipline and then you'll get some more money. Now I have a bad news for you. If, if the investors don't know you, they will never give you money. So you have to find somebody who is highly reputable in the investment community. So you bring this person to the investment community and they look at you, you don't mean nothing to them, but that person identified you as a potential scientist that they want to work with, they will invest to, because of them. So you need to find a partner going forward. And University of Toronto or UHN, their technology transfer offices sometimes are able to help with that, but sometimes you have to find that person on your own. And Finding a person, it's like, you know, trying to get a gold on, in a river with one of those things. Takes time, takes patience. And if you decide to, to commercialize something, you're looking at a horizon of 10 years, minimum to 20 years, and it's going to require your engagement from the day one to the last day. If you say, now I'm going to hand it off to two years, don't even start it because 
two years is nothing. But also finding a lead investor helps. Like if you're trying to get investment, yeah. if you can find a lead investor. Um, well, tell me, just say in one or two words, like what, what does your company do or what, just so that we have context. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just a student here, but I'm planning to form a, a startup, like maybe after graduation, take my Camp Stone, Capstone project to a company. So it yeah. might be a product uh, company, it can be a service company. So I'm, I just want to know what, how, how can I, I can navigate this. Okay, yeah. I, t I also teach a course in entrepreneurship. It's called in entrepreneurship Invention Plus Entrepreneurship. It takes kind of the MIT framework of invention and combines it with the Silicon Valley concept of entrepreneurship. So it combines sort of MIT Stanford thinking. It's APS 1041 starts this January. So maybe that's a, I don't know, that could be like we basically show people how to start and do companies and that sort of thing. So what you want to do is is get your get as much of your thing developed as you can without investment because investment is encumbrance. As soon as you have investors breathing down your neck, I think Milvis was right that you got to pick your investor carefully because if you've got if you're selling building a pacemaker and you got an architect breathing down your neck, it's going to be really hard to make that pacemaker. So you want your investor, your lead investor especially, to be an investor who's aligned with your purpose. So it would almost be better even to accept slightly less favorable terms from a, an investor who's very well aligned. And the other thing is you want to defer your investment as long as possible so that you're encumbered later rather than earlier in the game. So see how long you can operate on friends, fools, and family. And see how long it is that you can just figure out what your burn is and sleep on the sofa for a while and just try to push your team as far as you can to develop something before accepting investment capital. Because that's what we, even with Interaxon, we deliberately turned down investment. We only took a very little bit of investment. We only took about 30 million in investment because we wanted to do it all on product sales. So we got our product on Best Buy. We got it Best Buy stores all across North America, Amazon.com. We got the product out there and we we're selling it. We we're selling product, making money by selling something. If you can make money by selling something, then you can delay reduce investment, less investment, and take it later and get as much as you can by selling product or selling services or selling goods or anything that's direct business. Right. Just by way of hands, how many of you out there have a company? Just, okay, so a few. So mostly early on in your, your studies and... David? I can't. The, these folks have uh, you know, sweat equity in the, the subject matter, so to speak. So I, I can only make one point, and that is this early stage. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty wealthy community in Toronto. They do a lot of philanthropy. One of the things that I think we really need to build, and some of us are working on it um, right now, is venture philanthropy, where donors put the money in, they want their capital back, but no more than that, or maybe a tiny return. But the whole goal is get away from a situation where you are subject to the terms of perpetual ownership by a venture capitalist. The, the drawback is they may not be aligned in the sense that they have an interest or you know, you're, you, they would build around you a whole suite of things, etc. But the upside is in that early phase when you can get diluted really badly, no matter what the ownership regimen is, you can use that kind of venture philanthropy model to get what is, to some extent, free money, if you will. Um, and one of the terrible things here is these donor-advised funds, so all these community foundations or family offices that are very popular now, people throw their money into the bank. They have to put 3.5% of the, the principal out uh, each year. That's all. They're often making more than 3.5%, so the principal is growing. And this stuff sits in the banks, and the only people who are doing well out of it are the people who manage the money, who charge fees. So many of us are of the view that not only is that, that too low, but the banks, which are sitting on these billions of dollars of donor advised funds, need to kick up the arse to get moving, to make mobilize the money for venture philanthropy. And some other countries have done this. The UK has done some of this. There's also billions of dollars in dormant accounts all over the world. There's probably a billion or two in Canada, just unclaimed accounts that just sits there. So there's a real capacity here to do social or venture philanthropy in, the, in Canada. 
and there's a whole bunch of people on, working in social finance who are keen on this to help you get going without someone taking a huge share of your IP and your earnings in future. Yeah, that's really good. If you can do something like that, that's really the best. Great. So I know Yasmin has another question lined up. Hi, uh, my name is Sabrine, and I'm also a translational research student um, here at the University of Toronto. Um, so I had a question uh, for you, Dr. Naylor. Um, I know you wrote a McLean's article. Um, you were talking about um, uh, funding innovation um, on a federal level. And one of the things that you proposed was um, public advocacy and political advocacy to encourage the federal government um, to provide or increase their funding for innovation. So I guess a question that I have for you is how do you propose we do so, especially just because I, I often find and personally believe that within science, it's kind of its own bubble. Research isn't very accessible to the public. So how do we kind of translate that over into the public and encourage lobbying efforts? Yes, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, um, you, you almost have to break this out into um, buckets again. Um, you, know, you have all the, the open competitions of the granting councils that are science broadly understood. Wherever your curiosity and imagination takes you, that can lead to some great inventions and companies and, and disruption in the best sense of that word, a word that's overused and pretty negative at times. But then you have this whole sphere of applied practical science, to use Steve's term, that the translational problem-solving research, which is, as Milo said, very hard to get through the granting council process. So I, I don't think we figured out how to support that element. In 2014-15, the panel that I chaired recommended a billion dollar a year innovation fund be put in place by the federal government. Uh, the response of the federal government was to release the report late on a Friday afternoon with no publicity and ask us to change it repeatedly, which we refused to do, and then it got very, it did, it did not go over very well. The, the next government picked it up and you know, acted on a lot of it, but the notion of a big innovation fund never happened. And I think the country still needs a big, you know, huge bulk of money sitting that isn't granting council money, uh, that is there to enable that kind of scaling and innovation and evaluation. And without that, in the healthcare system, and other systems are faster moving, but this sludgy healthcare system of ours, I think it's really hard to get things taken up and used. And the same report, we recommended changes in procurement to make it innovation friendly. We recommended you know, a harmonization of some of the regulations. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Most of it hasn't been done. So it's, uh, you know, it's interesting that the later report on funding basic science and translation, well, I guess you call it translation in the sense that it's peer-reviewed basic science. But that kind of traditional granting council stuff, we got about 60% of what we asked for, and I think we'll get more in the years ahead. The other one has been far harder to get moving. And I think it's because all of you are need to, need to start raising your voices to say there's a missing piece in the funding universe. It's not going to be the councils. They, they played around in that space pretty unsuccessfully because it's an add-on. And it's not going to be ordinary businesses. You're, you're going to have to figure out a pot, venture philanthropy, social finance, some other pot, uh, an innovation fund that will really help you scale up. Thanks, David. I think Yasmin's got a couple of questions at the back. Oh, hi, Dr. Naylor, and thank you for everyone uh, for being here today. Uh, my question is, I would say someone in relation to that. My name's Stefan. I'm, I'm a student in the TRP program, and I'm a research associate in the Division of Cardiology at the Peter Montgomery Center. Um, so about a year ago, I was part of a group of pan-Canadian researchers who submitted an, an NCE application. Um, and I would say about this time last year, I woke up to an article in the Globe and Mail that uh, Minister Duncan was canceling the NCE program. And uh, it was being replaced by the New Frontiers in Research uh, funding stream. Um, and part of that has this transformation stream funding, and it's really pocket change uh, compared to what the NC was offering. And I guess when, when that article came out, it was really interesting to read the commentary of younger researchers saying this is a good thing because all this research funding in the NCs is going to these ivory towers. And then there were a lot of senior researchers, um, you know, part of the stroke network, age, uh, age well, and the stem cell network saying this is a disaster. It's going to 
uh, basically put a roadblock in, uh, you know, in front of innovation. And I was just wondering, uh, I'd love to hear your comments with respect to the message that sends to young researchers or researchers in general um, when you're trying to encourage this interdisciplinary work and you're canceling really, um, I would say, sizable, uh, impactful federal research programs. Thank you. So I, I've dealt with this a couple of times publicly. They'll do it again, one in Vancouver, the other time in May in Ottawa. Um, and there's a slide deck online that's circulating where I say this again. We did not recommend that. Um, I think many of us were taken aback by that decision. What we specifically said was that the NCEs should be used not only for what they are doing now, but for people like mathematicians and computer scientists who may not have partners to form national networks so that we could scale up. We're a subscale jurisdiction on the world stage. So let's get some collaboration in independent research and NCEs could do that. The current CFRF model, those big Canada First Research Excellence Funds or whatever they're called, is not working to that effect. It's a concentrator rather than a way of building network capacity. So my view was that taking the original NCEs out of play not only was it what we recommended, but it ran counter to the, the thrust of trying to have some areas where independent research trans transects civil society and business. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be business partners. It can be all kinds of other people, institutions, civil society, whatever, even the public sector that NCEs partnered with. So I was disappointed. I was puzzled. I didn't understand the logic of the decision. And um, you know, I think we're still seeing whether or not the new model works. Uh, very low approval rate in the first go, which is you know, again, not encouraging. I do like the fact that it was transdisciplinary, but we recommended in that report again that there be a pot of money for transdisciplinary specifically, and that the bigger issue was to get all the councils to work together so that all the funds can be transdisciplinary in a rational universe, right? You, we see so much convergence in science, broadly understood, that you know, NSERC and, and CHR should be talking to each other. If something comes in that doesn't fit one or the other, you know, Steve stuff, the wearables doesn't fit easily in one or the other, <laughs> then they should be putting a panel together, a wearables panel with in, you know, blue ribbon investigators from both sides. The NCEs tended to have that kind of adjudication process, so I'm with you, I'm sorry they're gone. And for the record, we did not recommend that we recommended adding the investigator initiated component to the NCEs. That's actually, that would be fantastic to put like a wearables panel together or something. And you, you know, when people talk about uh, transdisciplinary, we had this big argument about whether it's transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, or metadisciplinary, the disciplines of discipline. And uh, I, I said, you know, it's really none of the above. It's whatever you want at the beginning with passionary at the end instead of disciplinary. Albert Einstein said, love is a better master than duty. And so I've always felt that passion is a better master than discipline, to paraphrase Einstein. And what we should really be looking at is authenticity, or what I call authenticity, which is the integrity of authenticity. That is to say, when somebody's true passion is also, you know, that what you used to say is, love your what you do and do what you love. You know, where there's this intersection between, and, and, and so I think, I, I, I see a lot of that in Silicon Valley. I see a lot of that even in some startups here. It'd be nice to get more interpassionary, multipassionary, cross-passionary, metapassionary, and so on happening. Wow. You just don't know what you're going to hear, right? That, that was amazing. I, I thought he'd you. broken all the barriers with love in the Granning Council, but right. Steve, you've hit a new high. <laughs> so, Yasmin, you've got another question. Hi, uh, thanks for your talks. Um, my name is Anthony Lizard. I'm a first year PhD at IBME, but my question is more related to my time when I was at a CCRM, which is a regenerative medicine company. Um, they focused on commercializing new technologies. And with the, with, I don't know if you guys know about Novartis CAR T, they're quite long therapies, five to 10 years. So one of the things that they struggled with was um, when it came to the final stages, where did they get the continuing of funding? And I think reimbursement was a big thing that involves Health Canada and the government. Um, so I just want to a comment on 
because these therapies are so expensive, around 500,000 US or I think it's yeah, US dollars. Um, if Health Canada was not to reimburse some of these technologies, then they would go elsewhere in the world. So what would someone do if they've come to the final stage of their um, new cell therapy or gene therapy and they need uh, to reduce the cost? So first of all, Health Canada does not reimburse. It's all pro on provincial level and every provincial government actually decides which of the interventions they want to endorse at all. Uh, we had a, I think, very nice um, idea a couple of years ago where we had this Mars Excite program in which we actually will go to a company like yours and we will say, okay, this is an interesting technology. Let's try to test it. And there's a panel of people who are experts in the field. They create a clinical trial. We run a clinical trial at different uh, institutions in, in Canada, US, whatever, and demonstrate viability of the product to improve the, the caring for patients or improve the outcomes and actually demonstrate even savings because sometimes people will go and demonstrate how much money this is going to save the system and whatnot. So the intent was that once you go through all these hurdles, the provincial government at the time, it was a provincial government that was a partner, would essentially say, okay, this looks promising and we're going to have this procured. So we had a couple of companies who lined up for that program, just once again, Mars Excite, and went through the randomized control trials and demonstrated the utility of the product and the province didn't start procurement. And that killed the program. Because tomorrow, every single company who was in a pipeline to go through this test, because they had to put 1.5 million, 2.5 million investors were lined up in order to fund this, they all pulled the plug and moved away. So procurement, as David said, very, is a very important element. When you do commodity devices, that's different. But when you're in a healthcare system, you need to get procurement done. And, and actually, support it. So and sometimes these things really drive you nuts. And I'm, I'm a, a good example of that. I'm not trying to share the light on it. We created a product which will take a person who is quadriplegic, which both arms and legs are paralyzed, and move them from all four limbs paralyzed to only lower limbs being paralyzed. So they can use the upper limb. The cost difference between caring for the person who has all four limbs paralyzed and only upper, bo bo lower limbs paralyzed is about 2.5 to $3 million. The therapy costs, I don't know, $3,000, $4,000. And province is not paying for it. So they will save on every single patient $2.5 million. And there's probably about 250 in Ontario. So the, the, the cost savings are ridiculous. However, nobody's doing anything about it. And the sad part, so that's a controversial part is, for us to get to that point, to have this technology, federal government, provincial government has invested tons of money. And UFT through their programs and incentives have invested money in us. So we probably have spent somewhere between five and $10 million just to come to design the technology. And then the company came and invested another seven, $8 million to get this commercialized. So you're looking at about $20 million investment that the community has put into it. And we are not allowing this to come into the system because if you treat the first three patients, you return all the money back. And it's kind of crazy, right? So procure procurement is a really key important, and there's no system for this to be done in a transparent fashion. I do not know, if you ask me now, I do not know what is the right process for that. In, in 2014-15, we toured the country talking to innovators um, for this federal panel I mentioned earlier, and the, we heard really hair-raising stories that of people who'd invented something who were unable to get their own hospital or health region to buy it, and who ended up selling across the border to get a market. Yeah, and you know, th this is a huge issue in Canada. We, we called it, you know, the, there's a manifestation of the sort of uh, Groucho Marx syndrome. who once said he would never want to belong to a club that would have him for a member. And so it's, it's kind of the same with Canadian. If it's made in Canada, we don't want to buy it. You know, it's, if it's made in the U.S. or somewhere else, it's got to be better. It's so stupid. And, and uh, 
strange as a phenomenon. Uh, the, we have to develop procurement systems that are actually innovation friendly that give some advantage to Canadian IP. I'm not a fan of some of the protectionist rhetoric we hear from some of our friends, the tech bros, who are very noisy these days. Uh, not on side with that. Um, but, you know, it's one thing to be protectionist and to say, oh, gee, all the IP has to stay in Canada and all the talents should stay here and it doesn't matter if we pay them less than the Americans. We have branch plants here. It's, we should be able to pay them too little and blah, blah, blah. I find that stuff really off-putting. But what, what I don't find off-putting is the idea that we actually create procurement to give Canadian innovators a head start and to give them a real shot at succeeding. And we actually do the opposite. So we, we need to build in the healthcare system, in particular, a much more innovation-friendly uh, strategy for procurement to support Canadian inventors and innovators. Steve, you want to get in. Yeah, it, it, I find sometimes in Canada it's hard to find true love for uh, very far-reaching and, and futuristic in inventions. Like there's this kind of notion that of rewarding mediocrity. It, it, it often appears that if you have an idea that's either really good or not very good at all, you know, the, as the song goes, they hate you when you're clever and they despise a fool. You know, so if you're either really clever or really unclever, you're not loved. And love is somewhere in the middle, right? And so you, you sort of have to go to a place like Silicon Valley where they actually love you when you have a really crazy out there idea. And this is even even at MIT, this is what I found. I got pulled across to Silicon Valley. Well, the pull is westward, you know, to California. That's where they really love things that are way out there. And then even more so, the Chinese are just crazy over this. Like I was meeting with, I met with the most powerful man in China and the third most powerful man in China. I met all these people are coming and talking to me, you know, and and, and so it's, it, they're hungry for things that are really way out there, really the next big thing. Whereas I find in Canada, I don't feel that same love for, uh, like if I do something that's really mediocre, I think most of the work that gets loved is, is, is the work that I've done that's not that good. Like the times when I've been half asleep, when I stayed up all night and worked on something and didn't pay much attention to it and I was distracted by my daughter talking or something while I was writing, those are the ones that seem to get in more. The ones that I really was fully alert and attentive on those almost always get rejected. And so there's something, something needs to be done. I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I don't know, maybe you and I should talk a little bit too, because you seem to have some understanding of this. I, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when David Naylor talks about love. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I, I think we all feel at home here because I think that's that little bit of that sense of being the outcast or the other because you've got these wild ideas and how do you get people to to be excited about them at home in our own backyard it seems that for the bronze that's the canadian way you know yes we, we don't want it we don't we briefly wanted to own the podium i love that sentiment in, you know with the winter olympics in vancouver <laughs> and ever since then we've been happy to own the, the ground near the podium it makes me crazy I'm with steve on it. a lot of love a lot of craziness and yasmin over to you Oh. I, I've got the pleasure of um, the, the last question of the, of the evening, because then we're going to start our, our networking session. Um, so thank you all very much for being here. Um, th this is kind of an, I'm going to say an ongoing theme, but really this is only the second of our TR talks this year. Um, these talks happen every month, and I'm curious to see whether this theme continues, but this whole thing about Canada not showing a lot of love for what's being created in Canada uh, was also the theme at the last talk. Um, I just read a book by Mike Myers, the Saturday Night Live guy. Same thing. He was saying he wasn't accepted here. He went down to the States, and, and Canada just has this culture of waiting for somebody else to say, you're okay, and then we take it back. Um, and maybe that should be our movement to try and change that. But, um, you know, to these wild ideas that you're talking about, when you did a show of hands a little earlier, and there weren't that many people that were creating companies, that, and you know, a lot of the students here are early on in their education, and they're coming up with these wild, harebrained ideas. Some of them aren't really that crazy. They're you know, right in line with what we're supposed to be, but it's tricky to get the funding right at the beginning. So when you have a new idea, 
and you're new on the block, where do you go to get a little bit of funding just to see if you can even make anything happen? Well, what, what we found was that when you're, when you're new on the block and you're starting out, that you have to sort of fight for yourself. You have to, you really have to get it yourself. Like to get the thing started, I, I came up with a lot of really crazy ideas that, that, that people didn't believe in until I, until I built it. And what I had to do, what I, what I did a lot with a lot of my early inventions, like wearable computing, is I'd go around dumpsters, collect old stuff. I, I volunteered to help out at a TV repair shop. And the owner mentored me and helped get me access to things like lock-in amplifiers and stuff like that. In my childhood, I had who would believe in a kid, you know? So I went in. I went in there and I said, I want to volunteer to help out. And he said, Well, um, what do you know about fixing televisions? And I said, Well, I, I have my own business at, at home. I fix TVs for everybody in my neighborhood. And he said, Okay. So he went in the back room and closed the door, and he took a couple of minutes, and then he opened the door and he said, Okay, fix that TV over there. And so I asked him, you know, I said, well, the tubes are all out. And I said, give me a voltmeter. And I checked the voltage. And I found very quickly that the problem was the on-off switch. There's voltage across the on-off switch. And so what he had done is turned the TV around so it was facing against the wall. Uh, and the back of it was all open. But it was just simply shut off. And the tubes were glowing because it was instant on. So, you know, <clears throat> I, 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 had, I had no money. And I was trying to do these things. And what I, I, I did is I found a mentor, which is this... TV repair owner. I proved myself to the mentor by rapidly fixing the set and finding what the problem was. And I sort of earned the respect of my mentor in some sense and got mentorship and uh, got sort of resourcefulness. You know, I, I scrounged around a lot of dumpsters, collected old things, got things together, made things, made prototypes, proved my idea to people. So I had ideas are, are, are people like to say that ideas are a dime a dozen, but I say they're all dead wrong. Ideas actually have a negative value, not just a dime a dozen, a tenth of a dozen, but or twelfth of a dime, but actual negative value until there you actually do something. So you have to, when you come up with something, the onus is on you <clears throat> to make it happen and show investors an actual real prototype. As the chief scientist of the Rotman CDL, you know, I was the first chief scientist of the Rotman CDL, and now there's <clears throat> more of them, actually, more of us. And <clears throat> What I find the most annoying thing is when people come in and they show something, they make a pitch, and I say, well, show me, <clears throat> prove to me something. <clears throat> and I say, y you know, the, you got to help yourself. If you want to start a business, you've got to scrounge around, find mentors, get everything you can, do everything in your power to work on near zero budget. You know, it's, it's, you got to get a job, get a day job, get, use your own money, put your own money in there, get your own skin in the game. If you can convince other people to get skin in the game, that's good too. And you all pull together and you all work like dogs, you know, sleeping on the sofa, do whatever you have to do to cut costs and live. You know, I spent so many years, you know, sleeping under stairwells or whatever it was, whatever I had to do, you know, in Silicon Valley, sleeping on the floor, you know, just scrounging around, rummaging through dumpsters anything to just get something started and build prototypes and, <clears throat> and make something happen. And then finally, you get to a point where you actually have something really cool that you can show. And then when you get to the point where you can actually show something, then I think it's time to start showing it. But if you just walk in with a pitch deck to investors, my first, as any of the investment that I'm involved in, you know, I'm the chair of the Silicon Valley Investment Entrepreneurship Forum, for example, <laughs> people pitching me all the time with these decks. I look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, what skin have you put into it? You, you haven't, you're not hurting bad enough. You know, you're, you, you haven't, you know, if you don't believe in your invention, how do you expect me to? No passion. Passionately. Yes. Really Darwinistic than Steve. I, uh, you know that these are students that don't. I hope nobody's uh, in a, sleeping in a stairwell or whatever. So uh, I, I do think that we we should provide every possible support with some, you know, workshops, seed funding, something to make this a little easier. So I, and I think some of that has happened in the various 
incubators and entrepreneurship supports that have been created at the university. We could do a lot more. Um, I, I'm with Steve, I don't think you want to serve people breakfast in bed. Um, but, I, uh, but I do think these are full-time students in many cases and making things, facilitating access to some of the necessities is a, is a good thing to do and I, th I hope we're doing that better now than we did a few years ago. Determination, that really helps if you're... They wouldn't be here if they didn't have <laughs> determination. So, so quick one, I mean, there's a lot of money in the system. You need to look, and now with all this internet-based raising funds, there's all kind of different things, and you just have to be innovative to try to approach it. But you also have to, to resort to being, you know, sometimes you have very strange situations which happen to you, right? For example, I had two people walk into my lab and uh, they thought that I was infringing on intellectual property and they wanted to sue me. Nice in black. Swiss guys, and you know, and I said, you said, okay, uh, what are you doing? I mean, I did not know about a company, so what do you do? I mean, you're building stimulators. What kind of stimulators do you build? The ones that you copied? No, no, we didn't copy, we just came up with the same idea. What kind of stimulators do you have? So that we have this stimulator. Hmm, why don't we make a partnership? I take your hardware and add to the hardware these things which you definitely don't have because nobody else has it. And they said, okay, we can do that. And you turn this adverse event in which you may end up in a jail, <laughs> in about, no, not in a jail, but you know, financially really devastated, into like, hmm, we're partnering together and getting half a million dollars from the Swiss government to, to build a new generation stimulus. So you have to think sometimes outside of the box, and you should kind of you know, seize the opportunities. Right? It's not always, sometimes the bad things that happen may actually be ad advantage to if you know how to turn it from another angle, right? Great, so entrepreneurship e-harmony, excellent. <laughs> so I was gonna ask by show of hands, who knows what a TV tube is, but I won't do that. I will close here with thanking our guests who uh, have a uh, round of applause.